In this video, I will break down the process of creating these types of swirling patterns based on images. Not only do these make interesting results, but you can also apply them to wall art or your CNC or CAM projects. So, let's start with some theory first. First, we take any image and populate random points on top of it. For each point, we determine the gradient field of the image. Then, we move the point perpendicular to the gradient. We repeat this process over and over again, around 100 to 200 times, and trace the path of each point. Let's start by importing the reference image using the Import Image component. Right-click on the file path and choose Extract Parameter. This lets you select your image. You can choose any image, even a logo. The default X and Y values are too big, so I'll set custom dimensions. A resolution of 256 by 256 is enough for this project. Next, we create a gradient field that points toward the bright side of each mesh base. First, we create a vector pointing toward each corner point and control the amplitude by the brightness of the corners. Then, we find the average vector to get the gradient field. We'll use a few components for this. Mesh Explode, Deconstruct Mesh, Average, and Vector 2 Point. Start by getting each mesh face separately using Mesh Explode. Make sure to turn off the preview for this component to avoid slowing down your viewport. Pass the result to Deconstruct Mesh, which gives us each vertex's face color in normal. Each face has four corners. We take the average to get the center, which becomes our vector's starting point, and the vertices will be the vector's tip points. Now we have a vector starting from the center toward each vertex. To visualize this, I'll use the vector display component. The anchor point will be the average point, and the direction will be the vector itself. This component can be very laggy on a large scale, so I prefer using vector display EX. We can't see the results well, because the tips of the vectors are crossing. So, I'll normalize the vectors to a length of one unit to make them shorter and more visible. Next, I'll add a mass addition component to get the resultant vector. Since all vectors are equal in magnitude and point outward, they cancel each other out. We need to vary them based on the brightness of the vertex colors. In between here, we need to vary the amplitude of the vectors based on vertex color. For this, I'll use the split ARGB component, which gives me the alpha, red, green, and blue values as numeric values. These numbers increase with the brightness of the color. I'll use all three components together. For this, I'll use the expression f of r, g, b, x equals r plus g plus b times x. This adds all the components together, and with the variable x, we can control the influence. This can be directly used as the amplitude. Now we can see each vector pointing toward the gradient, or the bright side of each mesh base. This also gives us the character silhouette. Here, you could also create a line following these fields. The starting point will be at the average or the center of each face, and the direction will be our field, with the length based on how bright the corner is. These are just lines, but they give you an abstract artifact. You might use this to make string art or something like this. Let's refine this and name it a gradient field. Next, we populate points and make them move into this gradient field. Let's say we have one point here. The closest vector to this point is this one, so it will move in that direction. After it translates to another position, we repeat the same process, meaning we find a new closest vector and move in that direction again and again. I will extract the referenced image using mesh container and bring it forward. Now, on this mesh, we will populate points and move them into the field. For this, I will add a populate geometry and move component. The populate geometry component will place points on top of the mesh, and then these points will be passed to the move component. Now, for the translation vector, it must be the closest vector for each point. For example, the closest vector to this point is this one, so we will use this vector as translation. I will expand here to get more space, in between, I will use mesh closest point, point to point, and mesh to mesh. This gives the closest mesh face index for each point. We previously created the gradient field based on each mesh face, so we can simply extract the vectors here and choose the closest one using a list item component. I will flatten it to put all into one list. 
the index will be the closest mesh index. Now, take a look when I give this, the point will move in the direction of the closest vector. Sometimes the vectors are very short, resulting in small translations. I will normalize the vectors so that all translations have a unit length. Here this point has moved to a new mesh face. Next, it must move towards the new closest vectors. So we need to repeat the same step. I will just copy and reconnect that up. Now it has moved in a new direction. However, the problem here is that we cannot simply repeat this process manually a hundred times or more. We need a way to loop this. Clean this up by grouping and rename it to point control. Rename the next one to move toward closest vector direction. We will loop this setup meaning the point that has already moved to a new position will return to this setup and repeat the same process. For this, we will add two components, loop start and loop end. You don't get those components by default. You need to install the Anamone plugin. Go to this page and search for Anamone. Download the latest version and copy it. Go to File, Special Folders, Components folder, and paste your downloaded file there. Go to Properties and make sure to check the Unblock option if it is available. Then, restart Rhino. Between these components, we will place what we want to loop. Now the populated point will pass directly to loop start, and then to our closest vector setup. After translation, it will go to loop end. To make this setup work, we need two inputs, the number of iterations we want, and a trigger. Here we can see some results. The point just flickers around. What we are seeing here is the point after translation. We want to store the position of the point at each iteration. Right-click on loop end and select record data. Now we can see the path of the points. We can connect the points using a polyline. Plug the result directly into the polyline component. But here we get a weird result because the way it records the points is per each iteration. To fix this, I will add flip matrix in between. Now we can see the path better but the problem here is the line is too jagged. This is because the image we referenced is not smooth. In the image import setup, we need to smooth out the image before passing it to the next stage. The image, referred to as a mesh, can be smoothed using a blurred mesh technique. By adjusting the iterations, we can achieve a smoother result. This updated setup will replace the previous one. Currently, the curves are smooth and flow towards the gradient. Instead of moving directly towards the gradient, our goal is to swirl around the field. In a typical image, this gradient might not be immediately apparent, but here, we understand that the gradient points toward the center. The idea here is to swirl around this gradient, meaning we need to turn 90 degrees from the original direction. Essentially, the cross product of two vectors results in a direction perpendicular to both. Thus, we can replace the previous vector with the cross product to the z-vector. Additionally, we can control the influence using the z-factor. Now, the curves swirl around the gradient. You can see here that some of the curves are moving out of bounds. We need to find a way to remove curves outside the bounds. I'll take a corner of the image and create a polyline. I will trim the curve outside this region, so I will bring it forward. Another method is to remove the control points outside this region. We'll delete points outside this region using a call pattern and point and curve. First, test if the point is inside the curve or not. Based on the result, we can call out the points and pass them to the polyline. Clean this up and rename it to remove points outside region. If you take a closer look at the curves, they are not smooth enough, so I will add additional smoothing using the smooth polyline component. Using iterations, we can control the influence. Next step is giving thickness to the curves. For this, I use mesh pipe, which is faster relative to the native grasshopper pipe. You could obtain it by installing the Chromodorus plugin. However, this gives me an error, possibly because some of the curves are invalid or zero length. So I will call them based on their length. The curves will pass to the list, and their lengths will determine our pattern. Internally, zero curve lengths will become false for calling pattern. Now we have pipes without the problem. Let's rename this step to smooth out and clean up invalid curves. If we use this mesh directly, we get strange black shading. To fix this, I will use unify mesh in between here. 
Now this gives us all curves with equal thickness. Next, we control the thickness of pipes based on the brightness of the pixels in the referenced image. This creates the illusion of a 3D effect on a 2D plane. So we need a way to control the pipe radius at any point. Here I will use a setup involving deconstructing and reconstructing the mesh. This recreates the pipes, but it gives me some errors with empty branches. So I'll clean this up using clean tree with check empty set to yes. Now we just recreated the pipes with no effect. However, in between here, we can manipulate the vertices to adjust the mesh. The pipe has four corners, so I'll use partition list with a size of four. We'll trim back and replace it with the previous vertices. This doesn't change anything. We're just partitioning and replacing the partition back. But in between here, I'll scale each set of four vertices together. The center of scaling will be the average of the four points, and we'll replace them with the scaled version. Now we have control over the size of the pipe at any location. Clean this up and rename it to set pipe radius. Now, based on the image we referenced, we set the radius value instead of one single float value. Previously, we extracted image colors using this setup, so I'll copy and use it here. The difference is that we use here before blurring it. I'll move it forward based on this to control the pipe size. I will add the three components together. Find the average, flatten them, and pass them to a simple remapping setup. Now we have mapped the brightness values from 0 to 1. Next, we need to determine which brightness value to assign to each point. For this, I will use mesh closest point to find the closest mesh face to the average point. This gives us the closest index of the face, which I can use with list item to select based on it. It will be our scaling factor. Now we have variable thickness over the pipes. The pipes on the dark side of the image become smaller and increase in size as we move towards the bright side. This also provides a more pronounced effect over landmarks. Not only does this apply to characters, but you can also use this script for product design or similar applications. This final script and all other project files are available on Patreon. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.